Hello there everyone, welcome to the channel if you're new, welcome back if you aren't, I am EDJ, and now we are continuing we are continuing with the next part of Kings and Generals Julius Caesar series, and now we are in Caesar in Britannia and Germania. So I do know Julius Caesar did go to like Britain, but he kind of left. I, I believe Britain wasn't a part of Rome until the time of like Emperor Claudius where it kind of officially became, like, you know, a part of Rome. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll learn about Caesar, Caesar's exploits and just, uh, how things went. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really enjoying this series. I really enjoy, I really like the way Kings and Generals presents battles. You know, he's up there with, like, Epic History TV. I, I, I was thinking, like, huh, which one do I prefer? But they're just so good. They're probably the gold standards of, like, re representing, like, battles historically. So, it's hard. But I, I overall really like the both of them. And, yeah, I don't really have much else to add. I apologize, guys. <laughs> but I am here to learn, so... And learn I shall. So... Yes, yeah, so if you want to watch the original video without me talking or, you know, pausing to talk or whatever, the link is down in the description down below. And without any further ado, let's just get right into it. Let's watch Caesar in Britain and Britannia and Germania. Gaius Julius Caesar's campaign in Gaul was a resounding success, with many decisive victories allowing him to conquer vast territory, making him rich and powerful. However, the political situation both in Rome and Gaul, coupled with Caesar's ambition, didn't allow him to sit idle, and the general would become the first Roman to invade Germania and Britannia. This video is sponsored by Imperator, Rome. Caesar had subjugated the majority of Gaul, either through conquest or political alliances, and was beginning to look for new opportunities to expand Rome's influence. But not all the Gallic tribes were taking kindly to Roman rule. One such tribe was the Veneti, located in modern Brittany. Despite signing a peace treaty with Caesar the year before, they reneged on this promise and captured a few Roman officers. As a largely seafaring nation, the Veneti were confident that they would be able to put their faith in their navy and force Caesar to make concessions. A navy and force Caesar to make concessions. However, Caesar spent no time trying to negotiate. Instead, seeing the act as a direct declaration of war, and marched on the tribe. Initially, he found little success. Due to their large navy, the Veneti were able to effectively hop from town to town, moving entire populaces and their belongings, denying the Romans a pitched battle or siege. Standard Roman tactics proved ineffective, therefore, and it was clear that, in order to win, Caesar had to defeat the navy. With Yo, I swear, watch Julius Caesar- Watch him just build a navy right now from scratch. <laughs> I don't know how he's gonna solve this, but like, I just imagine he's just gonna build something and win. Let let's find out. No navy on hand, he ordered that a fleet be built in order to take oh on the Veneti navy. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm happy I got that right. Like I said, guys, I don't know I don't know anything about the Gallic Wars. I'm not really well versed in this era. All I know is mainly the battle the final battle of like Elysia versus Generics and you know, but the specifics leading up I don't know. But like I get the impression from some of the past videos where Caesar would just build bridges and stuff that yeah, he was just gonna build a navy, and they're just gonna fight now. And I, I feel like I'm starting to get to know him better because I, I got that correct, even though I kind of meant that more as a joke. But <laughs> I'm happy to be right. <laughs> but compared to the Roman ships, which were designed for the Mediterranean, the Veneti ships, designed for the Atlantic, were much stronger and taller, and the Romans found them impossible to ram or board. It was only through the ingenuity of one of his legates, Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus, 
who suggested that they use billhooks to cut down the sails and cripple the Veneti boats, that Caesar was able to defeat their navy. With this issue sorted... Dang, dude. You know, I'm starting to see that a huge part of Julius Caesar's strength is his ability to just build crap really fast. <laughs> oh man, like he's got some of the greatest engineers on hand. Are you kidding me? He just got people there. It's like, oh man, let's just build stuff and they'll do it. Like, I think of like Alicia, I think that's the proper name, where he just builds a wall. Like, Julius Caesar can just build stuff. He's like Bob the Builder, you know? He's like playing Fortnite in real life. He's just, just, just building stuff. <laughs> So, man, I never thought, you know, like, it goes to show you, I guess, the power of engineering, right? Like, dang. It, it now seemed that Caesar would be able to move on to new conquests. Once again, though, his plans were put on hold in 55 BC, when yet another roaming German horde, composed of Usipetes and Tenchtheri, began threatening the Rhine border. These tribes previously rivaled the Swabi, but were now fleeing in huge numbers, Caesar giving their total number, including civilians, as 430,000. They had already slaughtered the Menapii and stolen their ships in order to cross the river, and were now pouring into Gaul. Upon hearing about this, Caesar was once again compelled to act, as he was worried that the Gauls might join the Germans in an attempt to oust the Romans. Some Gallic tribes in the Rhine Valley had indeed sent emissaries to the Germans, providing them with food and intelligence, encouraging them to move deeper into Gaul. Caesar gathered a council of Gallic chiefs, and convinced them to provide more cavalry for him to confront the Germans. This served two purposes. Firstly, Rome's cavalry had always been lacking, and the Gauls were renowned horsemen, and so filled a crucial role in the army. And secondly, because cavalry was composed largely of nobles or wealthy persons, they would act as hostages, ensuring good behavior. He then gathered five of his legions and headed to the Rhine. The Germans had sent a portion of their cavalry ahead of their main force in order to carry out raiding missions. But hearing that Caesar was getting close, they sent emissaries in order to delay him. They asked Caesar to negotiate, claiming that they were only in Gaul because they had been forced to flee from the Suebi and promised to ally with Rome if Caesar could provide them with land in Gaul. However, Caesar suspected that the Germans were delaying and continued his advance. The envoys continued back and forth as Caesar continued to progress towards the German camp, sending forward his 5,000 cavalry as an advanced force, but with orders not to provoke them into attack. However, upon seeing the Roman cavalry separated from the main force, the Germans fell upon them. The Romans initially tried to hold their ground, but were eventually overwhelmed and retreated to the safety of Caesar's camp. Caesar... So... Yeah, it seems a bit... So he sent his cavalry, but without telling them not to engage in conflict, even though... Yeah, essentially, it comes across like Caesar was already going there for a fight, so that, that seems odd to me, and... Yeah, obviously, you know, the, the Germans are seeing it like that, so... Yeah, that, that was a bit weird. I probably, I probably have to rewatch that again. That likely underplays the amount of casualties taken, giving the number as 74. But he does mention that two brothers of the famous and influential Piso family had died in the fighting, something that Caesar could not let go unpunished. Refusing to hold back any longer, Caesar gathered his force to attack the Germans. But before he moved off, the Germans sent a party of diplomats, including high-ranking nobility, to treat with Caesar, once again asking for peace and apologizing for the attack. As the Germans had already attacked apparently without provocation, Caesar refused and took the delegates as prisoners. He then drew up his army in three lines and moved swiftly to the German camp. 
The Germans, assuming that Caesar still would have been delayed by their envoys, were caught completely unaware. The legions fell upon their camp. Caesar brushes over the details, but it seems to have been somewhat of a massacre. The fleeing Germans were pursued by the Roman cavalry. Some made it across the river in their boats, but many tried to swim across and drowned. Hearing of the defeat, the German cavalry which had been pillaging returned across the Rhine. Caesar's army had taken minimal casualties. Yeah, that, that was a complete one-sided battle. <laughs> I don't even want to call that a battle, that was just a one-sided thing. Yeah, the, the Germans were not ready at all for Caesar, and in their attempts to delay, they just kind of screwed themselves. So, yeah. <laughs> it is important to note that while Caesar portrayed this as a great victory against a marauding Germanic horde, this is not how others saw it. To Caesar's political rivals in Rome, Caesar had broken the armistice with the Germans by antagonizing them with his cavalry, imprisoned diplomats, which was effectively a declaration of war, and then carried out a massacre, including civilians. Caesar needed something to distract the Senate and win the minds of the people, so he decided to boost his popularity by doing what no Roman general had ever done before, crossing the Rhine. The Germanic tribe Ubii offered its ships, hoping that the Romans would assist in their war against the Suebi. Caesar, however, deemed this unworthy of the Roman people, and instead decided to build a bridge across the Rhine between modern <laughs> Andenek and Neuwied. I'm telling you, man, like, Caesar must have had the greatest, like, engineers in his army, because he's just like, I'll just build something, you know? It was an engineering marvel. The legion's engineers used winches to act as pile drivers, driving stakes deep into the river, and constructed the 140 to 400 meter by 7 to 9 meter bridge in just 10 days. Insane, man. Yeah, like, watching Alexander the Great from Epic History TV and Napoleon, yeah, we. I mean, obviously they used engineers, but... I didn't see them use engineers to the extent that Julius Caesar is using them, you know? Like, he, he's making really good use of it, and yeah, now you're kind of seeing the value of engineering in warfare, right? So, yeah, it's a very, very underrated, but when thinking about it, yeah, a very important skill, right? Wow. Caesar found the lands beyond the Rhine almost deserted taken aback by the Roman speed and their feat of engineering, the Germanic tribes in the area had retreated deep into the Germanic forests, where they had amassed a significant army. However, Caesar had no desire to be caught in a prolonged campaign in foreign territory against a notoriously dangerous enemy. He spent just 18 days on the German side of the Rhine, burning villages and crop fields before returning and dismantling the bridge. The campaign was a proof, not only to the Germans, but also to Caesar's rivals in Rome, that he could overcome anything and do as he pleased. Caesar's next ambition, Britain, was once again a perfect propaganda target. The island was on the edge of the known world, and rumoured to be a land of monsters and vast riches. It had remained effectively untouched and bringing it into Rome's sphere of influence would be a significant achievement. According to Caesar, the Britons had provided some of the Gallic tribes with the resources needed to make war. While this was a weak casus belli, Caesar was, by now, effectively doing what he wanted with <laughs> little oversight. He began gathering intel from the Gallic merchants and sent a small reconnaissance force to the island whilst he mustered the ships he used against the Veneti and prepared to cross with the 7th and 10th legion. He set sail from modern Calais and safely made it across with most of his army, but his cavalry had been delayed by bad weather. The Romans saw the Britons had amassed along the white cliffs of Dover in huge numbers, with infantry, cavalry and chariots, and with every warrior painted in fierce blue war paint. Caesar moved further down the coast in order to find a better place to land, 
but was shadowed by the Britons' cavalry and chariots, who were easily able to keep pace with the fleet. Dang, they were ready, huh? They were like, oh, th these guys are coming, let's get this assemble. Wow. Uh, for a second, I thought Caesar was going to catch him unawares, but... Yeah, like I said, I just know Caesar was here for a bit, then left. But I do want to see, like... You know, it it's interesting seeing these nations, you know, like... Especially coming from the Napoleonic, you know, later down history era. It's, like, kind of like these earlier nations. I don't know, it's just really cool to see. And just how much of an influence Rome kind of had on the whole entire world, you know, especially Western civilization. When the Romans finally found a suitable beach, Caesar arranged his transport vessels into a long line with his warships on his flanks and ordered his men to disembark. As the transport vessels had deep keels, however, they were still some way from the shore and the legions were forced to wade in waist-deep in water to try and reach the beach. The Britons saw their opportunity and attacked, firing missiles into the ranks of the legionnaires as they struggled through the water, weighed down by their armor. The Briton cavalry charged in and out of the Romans, the height advantage of being on horseback, allowing them to fight much more effectively than the Romans stuck in Dang, they're doing much better than I thought. Like, I just expected Caesar to walk in and just kick everyone's butt. But, yeah, this opening, they're doing really good. And I think they chose, like, the the best position to attack from, right? Like, them having to struggle. They're, like, overall really well done. Like, I'm pleasantly surprised. <laughs> in the water, the legionaries were taking significant casualties. And seeing this, Caesar moved his shallower keeled warships up the flanks so that his missile troops and ballistae could fire into the Britons' sides. Still, the legions were wavering, with some men not even being willing to get off their transports. It was not until an eagle bearer of the 10th legion leapt into the water and waded towards the Britons that the legions rallied and rejoined the battle in earnest. The fighting was fierce and contested, with the Romans gathering to their nearest standards to try and maintain some form of cohesion, while Caesar used rowing boats to ferry men from the transports to areas where the Roman front line looked to be in danger. Finally, the Romans were able to push through the shallows onto the beach, where their organization and heavy armor could come into play, at which point the Britons broke off and retreated. Caesar, without any cavalry, had no choice but to let them escape. We don't know the numbers of dead on either side, but being a contested landing, it's likely that the Roman losses were greater. Following the battle, the Romans established a camp on the beach, and the Britons sent delegates to sue for peace, probably to assess the Romans' purpose in the area. They were on home ground and could afford to wait to see what Caesar's next move would be, whereas Caesar, with no supply line, would be pressured to make the first move. Mm -hmm. Caesar accepted the peace, and the Britons sent a small number of hostages, promising more later. The cavalry that had been waylaid did try and cross once again to meet Caesar, but were caught in a storm and forced to turn back. This same storm damaged the ships that Caesar had anchored off the beach, demoralizing the Romans who could no longer escape the island. Dang, dude. Yeah, I don't know why I expected. I, I thought this would go pretty smoothly, like with the with the Germania part. But yeah, things are going pretty They're not starting off that well, you know? Like Man, just want to see how Julius Caesar overcomes this, you know? Salvaging what materials he could from the most damaged ships, Caesar began repairs. He sent one legion at a time to forage for food, whilst the others defended the camp on the beach. However, whilst one of the legions was out foraging, the camp watch reported seeing dust on the horizon moving their way. This, combined with the lack of the promised extra hostages, was enough to alert Caesar to what was happening. He gathered two cohorts and marched quickly to the legion's location. Whilst foraging, the legion had been ambushed. Scattered and focused on collecting food, 
the Britons had been able to kill a substantial number of them in the initial attack. The Legion had managed to regain some level of discipline, snatching up their weapons, but they were surrounded by the British cavalry and chariots. British charioteers were trained to throw missiles from their chariots and then dismount to fight on foot before hopping back on the chariot when the fighting got too hard in order to regroup. Mm. This gave them the staying power of infantry and mobility of cavalry, a tactic Caesar admired but was now taking a heavy toll on the surrounded legion. Upon Caesar's arrival with his cohorts in formation, the cavalry and chariots retreated. The Britons had no desire to fight heavy infantry in formation in a pitched battle without their own infantry support, and allowed the legion to withdraw to camp with Caesar. However, bolstered by this success, the Britons amassed their full force of infantry, cavalry and chariots, and marched on the camp. Caesar oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, Caesar has not been doing well, but I think... I think now things are finally going to turn, now that he can face them. You know, granted, they have they, they have the numbers, but Caesar has the discipline and just the, the well-oiled machine that was the Roman army. So, granted, he only has two legions, but still, they're, under Julius Caesar, they're some of the best, right? Um... Only mainly because of his leadership, obviously, but, you know, still, like, Rome, the Romans have such great discipline that they can overcome great odds. Like, as long as they can get the fight, they can actually fight now, you know, without having to worry about the terrain or anything. I see Julius Caesar overcoming this, despite the numbers. Caesar drew out his legions to meet them. So far, he had been fighting in difficult circumstances in water, in ambushes, against a high- Yeah, but now, now when, now when the circumstances are more even-ish, you know, without having to worry about the water or isolate, being isolated, yeah, Julius Caesar is gonna show them, I think, the power of Rome, you know? Highly mobile enemy. But this was an ideal situation for the Romans, where their formations and discipline could truly make a difference. Mm -hmm. The Britons charged, but in these conditions, the Romans had a significant advantage. Whilst the chariots and cavalry had proved highly effective against small groups of Roman infantry, with the legions in a cohesive line, they now had little effect. The Britons quickly caught on to this fact and disengaged, their chariots and cavalry leaving the battlefield. The Roman infantry was now able to surge forward and catch a portion of the Briton infantry, routing it completely. The Britons were excellent at hit-and-run tactics and ambushes, but in set-piece battles, the Romans were far superior. Once again, the Britons sent a peace delegation, and Caesar, knowing that his options were limited, and that he did not have enough resources to carry out a full campaign, accepted, and then hastily withdrew from the island during the night. Yeah... I'm not sure I would call that a failure or not, like... He kind of just went there for publicity, you know, took some losses, won the first official battle, then just bailed. <laughs> um, yeah, it just seems like... I don't know how to describe that, but yeah, I, I wasn't fully prepared, you know? So yeah, that, that was just a, a small little adventure, I suppose. However, on his way back to Gaul, two ships were blown off course in a storm. 300 Romans were stranded and surrounded by a Belgae tribe, the Morini, who Caesar had only recently subjugated and were keen for spoils and revenge. The Romans were assailed from all sides with missiles in hit-and-run attacks against their small group. Caesar caught wind of this and gathered as much cavalry as he could to personally lead them to the men's rescue, managing to ride down the Gauls and save the Romans with only minimal casualties. Labienus would later be sent into the Belgae territory to winter there and reinforce Roman rule in the area. Neither the invasion of Britain nor this foray into Belgae territory were significant military achievements. However, they show why Caesar was so loved by his men. 
He was brave, achieving things no Roman had ever done before. He was calm under pressure, and most importantly, he would lead from the front and showed that he cared for his soldiers and was prepared to risk his life to save them. Yeah, all the great leaders, you know, could just win the respect of their men, you know, like Napoleon or Alexander the Great. Like, Julius Caesar isn't afraid to get his hands dirty, and obviously, you know, that just instantly wins you the respect of your soldiers, you know? Like, you're willing to be there with them and, like, defend them, like... Goes to show you how Julius Caesar just, like... You know, why he's so regarded and highly held as, like, one of the greats. Because of just... He, he, he was great, you know? Like, you just see his qualities on display and it's like, yeah. You, you see why he got as far as he did. The Britain campaign had not achieved much for the Romans, but it did provide Caesar with crucial knowledge about the Britain's military, the climate, and the level of preparation that he would need to succeed, lessons he would learn from for next year. Moreover, the Roman public and Senate were amazed by his feat of crossing the channel into unknown territories, and a full 20 days of thanksgiving were declared to recognize his achievement. Well, he, he certainly succeeded. Like I said, I, I wasn't sure that that was a small adventure, but either way, he, he has succeeded in what he wanted to do, which was distract the Senate and get the people to like him. And he's, he did it, mainly just by doing things no one else would do, right? Like showing his adventurous, you know, bravery. The history of the Celtic people is often forgotten when talking about Roman conquest, so we decided to remedy this situation. Alright, I think he's done, so next. Alright, so yeah guys, that was super interesting, it was cool to see, you know, I guess, one of the earlier, yeah, Roman meeting the Britons, and, you know, just some more of Julius Caesar's skills on display through engineering, his audacity and bravery and ex exploration just a lot of great qualities on display this video and overall i'm really looking forward to seeing more from julius caesar so with that said guys i hope you enjoyed the video i will see you all in the next one bye everyone